so uh, a very good morning to all of you so in today's uh, general club we will discuss uh, uh, a, a gen, uh, an article published in uh, any gem uh, lately and that is on a uh, transplant in uh, multiple myeloma newly diagnosed multiple myeloma which called determination trial we have said the uh, link for the study before so we have couple of uh, friends from our um other institutes as well that is adr uh, we have dr uh, nikita uh, from adr and and, uh, and some students there good morning everyone thank you so much for the kind uh, invitation so i think uh, uh, laboni you can start after the end of the uh, after end of your presentation we'll have a discussion uh, among ourselves yeah yes okay yes. okay so start so uh, good morning our respected teachers and colleagues uh, so welcoming you all to today's uh, janu club the article for today is uh, triplet therapy transplantation and maintenance until progression in myeloma uh, the determination trial which was published in nejm on 5th of june 2022 so we'll start with a brief history of uh, myeloma treatment so looking at the evolution of myeloma treatment uh, we see that uh, while the first documented case was as far back as 1844 plasma cells was, were first described in 1895 the first large case series on myeloma was published in 1929 melphalan uh, in the treatment of myeloma came into the picture uh, in 1958 first uh, and subsequently in varying doses and corticosteroids uh, were first used in the treatment of myeloma in 1962 so uh, the first study on uh, auto transplant in myeloma was in 1983 and uh, this showed uh, the efficacy of high dose uh, melphalan at doses of 100 to 140 mg per meter square in the treatment of uh, multiple myeloma the first uh, uh, randomized trial on transplant in um, myeloma was published in 1996 so uh, this showed uh, the uh, good response rates with high dose melphalan in comparison with uh, standard dose melphalan and uh, it also showed uh, good overall response rates of 81% versus 57% good, good cr rates as well as uh, uh, improved event free survival of 28% versus 5% in the uh, high dose melphalan as compared to the standard dose melphalan groups it also showed a significant overall survival benefit uh, with the five year os of 52% versus 12% uh, percent in the uh, standard dose arm so uh, over the years uh, with the uh, advent of uh, new efficacious uh, treatment options uh, we see that uh, the response rates in myeloma have improved so uh, the rates of uh, in blue we see that the cr rates have improved over time with the newer treatments and as well as uh, which improved uh, bgpr rates so uh, so this uh, so this was uh, the uh, uh, this uh, ifm 2000 uh, so this was another important trial uh, in 2017 so in this trial 700 patients with multiple myeloma were randomized to receive induction therapy initially with initially with three cycles of rvd and then consolidated either with five additional cycles of rvd or with high dose melphalan plus uh, stem cell transplant followed by two additional cycles of rvd so uh, patients in both the groups uh, received maintenance uh, lenalidomide for one year and the primary endpoint here was progression free survival so uh, the complete response rates were higher in the transplant group than in the rvd alone group of 59% uh, versus 48% this was a statistically significant uh, as was the uh, percentage of patients uh, with a negative mrd so the, the negative mrd was also higher in the transplant group uh, the pfs uh, uh, was uh, this uh, the, the pfs rates were also better in the transplant group Uh, with the median pfs of uh, 50 months versus 36 months however um, there was no significant difference in the os and uh, uh, with the four year os uh, of 82% versus 81% so coming to our uh, present uh, study so uh, the rationale for this study is that uh, with the uh, advent of so many new efficacious treatment options 
the goal is now to uh, to look for a further improvement in first line treatment with both non transplant and transplant based approaches to increase pfs and os it is also important to determine uh, whether individual patients may uh, benefit from a particular approach that is personalizing the treatment so uh, this phase 3 determination trial was originally des designed as a parallel study to the ifm 2009 trial which we just uh, discussed but this was amended to include the use of lenalidomide maintenance until progression as compared to the previous trial where it was continued for a fixed duration of 1 year so uh, this was a randomized open label trial which was conducted at 56 clinical sites in the us the recruitment uh, took place from october 1st 2010 to january 30 2018 the protocol was approved by the uh, Inter institutional review board or ethics committee at each site and all participants provided uh, written con consent uh, informed consent before the treatment so coming to the design so uh, all patients received initially one cycle of rvd before randomization so subsequent to this they were randomly assigned in a 1 is to 1 ratio to the rvd alone group or to the transplant group the uh, randomization was stratified according to the iss stage and the cytogenetic risk profile and with high risk being defined by 17p deletion a t414 translocation or t1416 by fish a uh, standard risk Uh, was uh, defined by the absence of any high risk abnormalities and undetermined risk by test failure so as we see here uh, eight, a total of 873 patients were recruited a uh, screen and assessed for eligibility of whom 144 were excluded uh, so uh, uh, reasons included uh, they did not meet the eligibility criteria they, they either declined to participate or withdrew consent um, or discontinued the trial so 729 received the first cycle of rvd Uh, subsequent to it, seven did not receive any further treatment. So finally, seven twenty-two patients underwent randomization. Uh, so of these uh, patients, three fifty-seven were assigned to the RVD alone group and three sixty-five to the transplant group. Of patients uh, in the uh, RVD alone group, sixty-six did not uh, proceed uh, to the maintenance uh, therapy with lenalidomide, either because of disease progression or because uh, of in investigator judgment or patient decision to discontinue. or due to any serious adverse events death or any other reason so uh, a total of 291 completed the cycles and proceeded to the maintenance therapy uh, at the end of uh, this um, uh, the trial 261 were alive of whom 90 had died and six were lost to follow up in the transplant group a total of 310 patients were ultimately uh, given amelphalan uh, with uh, auto uh, stem cell transplant 76 did not uh, proceed to the lenalidomide, lenalidomide maintenance therapy either because of disease progression or uh, discontinued because of investigative judgment or patient decision or any serious adverse events or death a total of 289 patients completed uh, cycle 4 and 5 uh, and went into maintenance therapy and at the end of the study 273 were alive and 88 had died so uh, patients uh, uh, to be included in the trial had to have a diagnosis of multiple myeloma according to the international myeloma foundation 2003 diagnostic cr criteria with documented symptomatic myeloma with myeloma related organ damage which was measurable by serum or urine evaluation of the monoclonal component or sflc assay uh, aged between 18 to 65 years with the ecog performance status of less than or equal to 2 with the negative hiv report within 21 days of uh, entry and with the a negative upt uh, test that was repeated again uh, before starting lenalidomide uh, exclusion criteria included any particular systemic therapy uh, primary uh, amyloidosis or myeloma which is com complicated by amyloidosis known brain meds any intercurrent uh, severe or uncontrolled infection or illness uh, pregnancy or breastfeeding uh, any social or psychiatric issues which would render the patient unable to comply with an anti anti thrombotic treatment regimen and peripheral neuropathy more than grade 2 uh, within 21 days of initiation of the uh, protocol so uh, this was the uh, uh, so trial schema so uh, after registration uh, so uh, initially after the first cycle they were randomized into either the rvd alone or the rvd plus transplant arm so uh, so both the groups received two additional at least two additional uh, cycles of rvd followed by stem cell collection patients in the chemo uh, alone group then received five additional cycles whereas those in the transplant group received high dose melphalan which was at a dose of 200 mg per meter square adjusted for ideal body weight 
plus transplant and on recovery which was usually around at day 60 post transplant we were given two additional rvd cycles so each uh, rvd cycle included uh, lenalidomide uh, with the initial dose of 25 mg from day 1 to day 14 um, q21 days and uh, along with uh, a bortezomib 1.3 mg per meter square day 1 4 8 and 11 and oral dexa at a dose of 20 mg uh, 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 which was at a dose of 10 mg on days 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, 9, 11, and 12. This was followed by lenalidomide maintenance, 10 to 15 mg uh, until progression and un unacceptable toxicity or withdrawal. So the primary endpoint for the study was PFS. Secondary endpoints included response rates, duration of response, time to progression, overall survival, quality of life, and adverse events. Response assessment was done according to the IMWG response criteria on day one of each cycle after transplant and before the uh, cycle four RVD in the transplant group, just before uh, lenalidomide maintenance and four weekly while on maintenance. So patients who discontinued treatment before progression were followed every two months until progression and all were followed for survival. Safety was evaluated throughout the treatment, including uh, during transplant and through the 30 days after receipt of the last dose of a trial drug. They were grade, graded according to the CTCA version 4.0 and uh, the relationship of adverse events to the trial treatment uh, was assessed uh, in accordance with the WHO Uppsala monitoring center system. Quality of life was assessed with the EORTC uh, QRQ C30. Uh, so scores ranged from zero to 100 with higher scores signifying better quality of life. This uh, quality of life is also assessed with the uh, multiple myeloma module, which included uh, uh, Parameters that uh, that were uh, that included uh, disease symptoms, side effects of treatment, body image, and future perspectives. Here scores range from zero to hundred, with higher scores signifying worse symptoms. So, uh, so uh, taking a ninety percent part to detect a thirty percent lower risk of disease progression or death in the transplant group uh, compared to the RVD alone group, the sample size uh, was finally uh, came out to be seven twenty. This corresponds to a hazard ratio for disease progression of death of one point four three in the RBD alone group compared with the transplant group. The PFS analysis was conducted using a stratified two-sided log grant test with the overall type 1 error rate of 0 0.05. Uh, the confidence intervals and p-values for the uh, secondary efficacy analysis were adjusted with the use of Bonferroni's procedure. For uh, quality of life evaluation, uh, testing, so uh, the uh, between group difference, the mean, uh, uh, the mean uh, change from baseline was analyzed. So, uh, the, so uh, the analysis was planned after the full information, that is at least 329 events of disease progression or, or death had been uh, obtained in the planned sample of 72 patients who had undergone a randomization. And calculations for power were adjusted uh, to include the potential to cross over from the RVD alone group to the transplant group before disease progression. There were two interim analyses that were planned after 33% uh, and 69% uh, of the pre-specified total number of uh, events of uh, progression or death had occurred. And finally, the data cutoff date for the full information analysis was on December 10th of 2021. At this point, 328 total events of either progression or death had occurred. So the primary analysis was performed in the intention to treat population. A time to event endpoints is estimated by the kaplan mia method uh, with uh, stratified log rank tests to compare the treatment groups. So multivariable st uh, stratified Cox proportional hazards model was used to estimate hazard ratios and confidence intervals. And this was performed with the use of SCS software. So coming to the results. So uh, the baseline characteristics of the patients were well matched between the two groups with the median age of 57 uh, versus 55. Uh, 122 patients, that is 34.2% in the uh, RVD alone group and 102 patients, 27.9% respectively were uh, more than uh, the age of 60 years. The ISS disease stage was a two or three in 179 patients in the chemo alone group, that is 50% uh, 50 versus 49.9%. Uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, the disease stage was well matched between the two groups. Also the high-risk cytogenetic profile was also well matched with high risk being found in around 20% in both groups. The median duration of treatment was 28.2% in the RVD alone group and 36.1 months in the transplant group. A total of 310 patients in the transplant group ultimately underwent transplant. 
291 patients, uh, that is 81.5% in the RBD alone group, and uh, 289, uh, in the, that is 79.2% in the transplant group, went on to receive lamellidomine maintenance. The median duration of maintenance was 36.4 months and 41.5 months, respectively. So uh, coming to dose modifications for lenalidomide, so for, uh, among these patients, 89% in the RBD alone group and 91.3% in the transplant group had at least one dose modification. The primary reasons were uh, either adverse events or illnesses, which included around 50% in both groups. The median follow-up was of 60, uh, 76 months. The risk of disease progression or death was 53% higher in the RVD alone group than in the transplant group with a hazard ratio of 1.53. Of the 328 patients who had uh, reached the event of disease progression or death, 189 were in the RVD alone group, 52.9%, with uh, 139 in the transplant group, that is 38.1%. The median PFS was 46.2 months in the RVD alone group and 67.5 months in the uh, transplant group, uh, this difference was uh, statistically significant as, as we see in this kaplan meier curve. The overall survival in both groups uh, did not, uh, the, the difference did not re uh, reach statistically uh, uh, statistical significance as we see in this uh, overall survival um, curve. So subgroup analysis for progression free survival was also done for all the baseline characteristics and uh, stratification factors. Although the study was not powered for these, it is interesting to note that there is a trend towards more marked P uh, improvement in PFS in patients with lower B BMI. Uh, so this is currently being, uh, being evaluated further. And these findings are consistent with the effect of obesity on some of the pathobiologic features of myeloma and the side effect profile of in intensive treatment. Also, the, uh, the median duration of PFS among patients with the high risk cytogenetic profile was 17.1 months in the RVD alone group and 55.5 months in the transplant group, which is uh, quite uh, significant as we see in this forest plot. Uh, so the percentage of patients who are finally alive without progression at five years were 41.6% and 58.4% in the transplant group respectively. So this comes to a hazard ratio of 1.66. Coming to the uh, responses, so the percentage of patients who had a, at least a partial response was 95% in the RBD group and 97.5% in the transplant group. And percentage who received, uh, who, who had, a, who achieved a complete response or better was 42% and 46.8%, which was, uh, none of these were statistically significant. The percentage of patients, uh, the, the median duration of response uh, was 38.9 months in the RVD alone group and 56.4 months in the transplant group. And the percentage of patients who had a, a CR or better at five years was 52.9% and 60.6% respectively. So coming to the role of MRD negativity. So um, this, uh, so uh, percentage of patients who had negative MRD by NGS was 40% in the RVD alone group and 54% in the transplant group. Some preliminary uh, correlative analysis were done of genetic mutations uh, in 140 patients, and these did not reveal any associations with, uh, regard, uh, with MRD or progression free survival. However, presence of a 17P deletion or a TP50, TP53 mutation was associated with a lower response rate. So, in, uh, so uh, as we see in this curve, so the in patients whom MRD was not detected, the five-year PFS after the evaluation for this MRD was 59.2% in the RVD alone group and 53.5% in the transplant group. Uh, for patients in whom MRD was detected, uh, median PFS was 33.4 months and 50.6 months respectively. So uh, coming to the five-year survival analysis, there were a total of 90 deaths in the RVD alone group and 88 deaths in the transplant group. Estimated five-year survival was 79.2% and 80.7% respectively. The hazard ratio for death was 1.1. The five-year OS among patients who had a high-risk cytogenetic profile was 54.3% in the RVD alone group and 63.4% in the transplant group. So coming to the analysis, uh, to the safety analysis. So uh, any grade three or higher event was seen in 78.2% uh, of patients in the, trans in the uh, RVD alone group 
and uh, a much higher rate of 94.2% in the transplant group. Of these, uh, the rates of uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, of the 61.9% in the chemo alone group had uh, hematologic uh, um, uh, events, while 89.9% uh, in transplant group had hematologic uh, side effects. So uh, then uh, coming to the rates of in infection, so this was also higher in the transplant group, 18.4%, uh, while 9.5% in the uh, RVD alone group. Uh, serious uh, 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 adverse events were reported in 144 pa pa uh, patients in the uh, chemo alone group, 40.3%, 40, 40 and 172 patients in the transplant group, that is 47.1%. Treatment-related serious infections were reported during maintenance therapy in 11.3% and 16.6% uh, respectively. So coming to uh, second malignancies, so uh, second primary cancers uh, were seen in 10.4% patients which is a significant number in the RVD alone group and 10.7% in the transplant group. Second primary hematologic cancers were seen in 2.5% versus 3.6%. In the uh, RVD alone group, there, were no uh, there was no incidence of AML or MDS secondarily. However, 10 patients in the transplant group developed AML or MDS subsequently. Uh, the five-year cumulative in incidence of invasive second primary cancers was similar in the two groups. So as we see here, uh, so uh, the, there were four uh, cases of AML and six cases of MDS in the transplant group, while none in the uh, RVT alone group. So coming to the quality of uh, life analysis, so the mean score for global health status was similar in the two groups, uh, except that uh, so patients in the uh, RVT alone group had they had a better mean change in scores during cycle five than those in the transplant group, uh, probably because this time point corresponded, corresponded uh, to the just post-transplant period. While patients in the RVD alone group, there was a lower mean change in scores during cycle eight than those in the transplant group at this corresponding time point. So this, we see that the gap is widest around a cycle five or just post-transplant uh, in terms of quality of life. So coming to uh, uh, treatment that was outside the trial protocol. So subsequent therapy outside of the trial protocol was admi administered to a total of 79.6% of patients in the RVD alone group and 192 patients in the transplant group. Of the 279 patients in the RVD alone group who discontinued trial treatment, uh, a total of 28%, that is 78 patients underwent transplant. So that is 35.1% uh, of, of all the patients who receive subsequent post-protocol therapy. So, uh, as, so as we see here, so this uh, is a list of all the uh, subsequent therapies that were received by patients um, of protocol. So uh, subsequent therapy included either uh, pomalidomide, lelandomide, uh, they included either uh, any of the proteasome inhibitors or the monoclonal antibodies. And uh, as we see here, so a transplant done within the next therapy was, uh, was seen in 13.1% 13, 13 of patients in the RVD alone group. So of, of the patients who received RVD alone, 13.1% received a uh, transplant at the, uh, at, at the next point of treatment. And uh, a total of 28% of patients in the RVD alone group and 47.3% in the transplant group received a uh, transplant at any time following the end of uh, study treatment. So uh, to discuss uh, the findings of the study, so this trial showed that superiority of uh, transplant-based first-line therapy with respect to PFS among eligible patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. These studies were consistent with the IFM 2009 trial findings. There was a significant 21.3 month benefit in the median PFS, and there was a 35% uh, lower risk of disease progression or death with, the tra with transplant than without. So this uh, study also found the value of long-term lenalidomide maintenance therapy until progression in both groups. So uh, uh, this we know because the median PFS among the patients who received uh, uh, RVD alone was 11.2 months longer than in the IFM 2000 trial, uh, 2009 trial. So in the 2000, uh, 2009 tri uh, 2017 trial that, is, that we had discussed uh, previously, uh, lenalidomide was continued for only one year. And uh, this had, a, uh, I mean, the, the PFS in our current study was uh, significantly longer. That is 46.2 months versus 35 months. So uh, then um, the 
also uh, this uh, this is also true for the transplant group so even among patients who received transplant the median pfs was 20.2 months longer than in the previous 2017 trial so this confirms that uh, there is an increased pfs with a greater duration of lenalidomide maintenance therapy uh, however despite median follow up of more than 6 years approximately one quarter of the patients had died uh, so there was no overall survival advantage of transplant versus no transplant so uh, the, um, so uh, the potential reasons for this could be that there are multiple highly efficacious options that are now available after first line therapy that have emerged uh, so in the previous trial uh, the, in 2017 76.7% of patients in the uh, rvd alone group who had relapsed received as a transplant as part of the second line therapy in the uh, this current uh, 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 i mean the, the the trial that we have just discussed so uh, the uh, in the determination trial only 28% of the patients uh, in this rvd alone group subsequently underwent transplant so uh, why uh, why has the number of uh, transplants reduced so possible drivers include there are some uh, like there's a perception on the need of uh, transplant on basis of uh, the lack of overall survival improvement in prior studies a uh, patient's condition at the time of relapse needs to be seen very often they may not be fit for transplant logistics cost also are important issues and uh, as well as the increasing availability of other efficacious therapeutic options so the effect of this limited crossover on long term outcomes warrants a longer follow up so uh, in the study uh, they looked at the importance of eliminating mrd so uh, uh, and also in personalizing decision making so increasingly high rates of elimination of uh, mrd may be associated with the new four drug induction regimens which incorporate highly efficacious monoclonal antibodies so despite similar rates of conventional responses between the two groups the transplant group had a higher percentage of undetectable mrd rates so this suggests the benefit from high dose melphalan uh, coupled with the long term lenalidomide and this may have resulted in deep and durable responses enhancing cyto reduction there was also an improvement in the anti tumor um, um, it is hypothesized that there is an improvement in the anti tumor immune micro environment and the tumor specific immunity after cellular reconstitution there is no difference in pfs in patients uh, with undetectable mrd however so uh, treatment adaptation which may be based on a uh, sustained absence of mrd may be a feasible alternative to the standard use of transplant as well as maintenance therapy until progression so uh, the toxic effects and the effect of treatment on quality of life must also be uh, discussed and individualized so uh, transplant was associated with a significantly higher incidence of toxic effects and a transient but clinically meaningful decrease in quality of life associated with transplant however as we saw uh, the mean subsequently uh, the gap reduced and the mean quality of life uh, even in transplant patients recovered with mean improvements of baseline uh, remaining numerically higher after transplant than after uh, rvd alone throughout the maintenance so uh, as for the uh, second primary so the uh, incidence of second primary cancers was similar in the two groups uh, the, the 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 difference in the development of aml and mds uh, Uh, in the transplant group versus no transplant was was consistent with the known mutagenic effect of high dose melphalan and stem cells and myeloma so the uh, five year cumulative incidence of second primary hematologic cancers was 1.6 uh, versus 3.5% in this determination trial however in the previous trial uh, they were 0.6% and 1.4% where they had received a, a shorter duration of lenalidomide so uh, finally uh, to conclude uh, pfs was significantly longer among those who were assigned to the transplant group than the rvd alone group uh, there was no demonstrated os benefit however uh, as has been seen in previous trials also so uh, when um, when deciding treatment uh, real world factors such as treatment burden acute and long term tox toxic effects patient preference and quality of life must be taken into account when making personalized decisions uh, for the treatment of a patient thank you thank you thank you so much lavani and that was an excellent presentation i mean you covered the trial the findings including the supplementary details which is which really set the stage for a nice discussion that will follow so if you can stop sharing the screen i will share one presentation and make me the host so that i can share so in next 
maybe in 15 minutes or so i will i will have a small discussion and with the help of uh, dr bhavsep sir and madam and uh, dr nikita from uh, adia so we'll try to discuss few important points which are relevant uh, to us for, for this uh, in, in particular to this trial so let me share the screen lavani you have to make me the host okay so i am not able to share my just a minute uh, yeah wait okay okay so um uh, so this was the trial schema rcs discuss discuss so this is a uh, phase 3 rct and they did uh, stratify based on iss and as well as uh, the cytogenetics uh, that is whether it is standard risk high risk or uh, the fish failure and this is the way they have treated the patient in arm 1 and arm b so if i have to summarize uh, the benefits overall in this study so so if you see the vrd and len maintenance after transplant was the ifm 2009 study and um, if you give len till progression that means it see mentioned i probably in this study they have changed the strategy of len maintenance in between and they made till progression it was one year before and they made it till progression in between so so 35 month was the ifm uh, um, uh, that was one year of uh, len and if you do if you give len till progression you get 10 month additional benefit of pfs and if you do transplant she did mention that you have 20 month improvement in the progression free survival so this is how you see those pfs benefits and pfs benefit but no os benefit i mean we did we did have uh, a multiple other trials as well where we get similar findings and we will discuss that maybe towards the end of this discussion about this os thing but we have ifm study we have uh, uh, the the european study which did so os benefit but i am ifm didn't have any os benefit right uh now before i move on so first thing is about the high risk now the definition of high risk in this study was three cytogenetic abnormality that is 4 14 14 16 and 14 20 and 17 p so uh, now this was in the supplementary where uh, uh, they have shown the high risk group pfs in over overall survival and you see the difference in pfs is huge like 17 versus 55 if you do transplant in a high risk myeloma but if you see the os there is a you know os tend to kind of being significant here five year os 54 versus 63 however the numbers are less here and maybe on subsequent follow we may get so it it seems like that the benefit of pfs is paramount in high risk group and os may be significant in maybe subsequent follow but i was looking at what is high risk and uh, and what is the definition of high risk in different groups so late so when this trial was designed these were the three factors which are high risk but subsequently you found that uh, you know we have gain of 1q then the iss become uh, I, riss you know so a couple of things that changed and the high risk definition obviously is changing so what do we will take as high risk and that will tell us because as i say that high risk has the maximum benefit and probably all high risk patients should go for uh, upfront transplant rather than you know a delayed transplant strategy so maybe i can start with uh, dr nikita now this is again uh, a high risk definition which is you know this is more you know in, including more other factors as well so uh, uh, dr nikita so what what is high risk for your institute and how do you define high risk and is it different uh, based on you know if you have seen st uh, other studies as well where the definition is bit different so and what is your opinion about this 1q gain where it is now including high risk in, even in the msmart uh, guidelines from the mayo clinic so yes dr lingaraj as you mentioned they've uh, included just three abnormalities uh, uh, of course for high risk uh, in addition to uh, the abnormalities that you mentioned 414 17p deletion 
1416. Now we have 1420. Uh, uh, amplification of chromosome, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a gain or amplification of chromosome 1Q. Uh, 1Q becomes, uh, uh, it is very, very frequently seen uh, in some of the series that has already been published. It's almost 30 or 40 percent. Uh, uh, there is a positivity rate of 30 to 40 percent. And uh, of course, your uh, residents will know that these are secondary cytogenetic abnormalities, 17P deletion and chromosome uh, 1Q abnormalities or 1P deletion. Uh, what we see in our series is 1Q amp uh, or uh, uh, 1Q gain is, is upwards of 50%. Uh, so that, uh, that actually does uh, kind of, uh, it is, there, is an, there is a higher proportion of uh, uh, high-risk uh, abnormalities as a result. But again, we do see, uh, of course, we have started uh, uh, doing uh, uh, fish regularly at the Institute for maybe the last uh, three or three and a half uh, years. Again, uh, logistics, uh, et cetera, comes into play and some patients cannot have it. So our follow-up is very uh, short, is very limited on uh, 1Q abnormalities. We see a lot of heterogeneity. Having said that, when we see a 1Q uh, uh, amplification or gain, of course, we treat them as high risk. Uh, additionally, uh, any ISS uh, 3 uh, circulating uh, uh, plasma cells, even if, even if uh, there is data to show, I mean, now 5% and above is recommended as uh, uh, plasma cell leukemia, but any percentage of plasma cells is what we would uh, categorize as high risk and treat them, uh, uh, of course, offer a, a, a transplant and uh, kind of always uh, do the uh, VRD followed by uh, transplant, followed by for high risk, we try and uh, offer Velcade plus uh, LEN. Uh, uh, maintenance. Thank you. So, so for the benefit of residents, the she has she did mention about gain of IQ, IQ, IQ and amplification. So there is a bit of difference there. So you have two copies usually for this uh, long arm of one Q. When you have third one, that is three copies, then that is gain. When you have more than four and more than four, that is two extra copies, then it is amplification. And by and large, if you see the studies they have definitely lately this division has been more uh, you can see more in uh, studies published lately where they have divided uh, gain and amplification separately and one such study was 40 where they have uh, clearly shown that you know the patients who have amplification that is uh, that is four and more than four uh, uh, copies of one key their pfs was low 21 month and um, so uh, Maybe I will take opinion from others also. Maybe uh, Bhausef sir, uh, what what do you think sir like uh, regarding one Q? So so for us, do we really need to look at about this gain and amplification in our patients and then and then take them as high risk and then take the call of transplant? What is your thoughts? Yeah, correct. I think uh, Lingana, you are trying to uh, come to some limitations of the study. So if I have to uh, go back a bit and try to see really. If this study was well designed, that is where I think we should be starting. But it scores all the points as far as design is concerned, as far as this is academic trial and supported by CTC and Alliance and, uh, and the standard uh, arm is getting RVD treatment, they are getting transplant and they are getting maintenance. So from, except for that, your uh, criticism of inclusion of a high risk category, I think this trial scores pretty well on the design as well as the performance of the standard risk group. Okay. Answering your question shortly, a 1Q, uh, as Nikita said, uh, 1Q gain and amplification are bad. 1Q amplification is more bad than the 1Q uh, gain, and these are secondary abnormalities. I think one thing to note is they are designed to increase subsequently. So this is one thing. Another is there is some data that you know, there is specific activity of elotizumab, etc. But whether just purely based on high risk, we should be offering transplant or not transplant, this is probably a nuanced discussion because this subset becomes smaller. And as you could see, not everything is matching. For example, in this study, 414, they tend to benefit by transplant disproportionately as good as a good risk candidate. But deletion 17P is not benefiting. So uh, probably this would uh, require... Uh, a lot of uh, data as far as concerned. So this was my take on this. Lingaraj, let's discuss. Do you see, see any criticism of this study as, uh, as far as the design is concerned? 
or a control arm or a outcome of control arm is concerned i mean the the control arm did as say, you know exactly the similar to the previous studies of ifm so i the, the, and there are no issues with the control arm and as far as the design uh, they did start with the limited duration of lanolidomide and in between i think the only thing that changed is the the continuous lanolidomide so uh, correct I, correct so, and this is the best pfs one can have with uh, rvd transplant and maintenance so probably it uh, this is very uh, good uh, a study to look at as far as i think the way it was conducted is concerned uh, so i think we can move on that's my yeah. thought on the study design and the risk of uh, the stratification yeah so this is something which uh, uh, the lavoni has also shown in the in the presentation that those who were mrd negative after rvd and transplant and another pfs was pretty similar but those and that was quite good uh, improvement in pfs in those who were mrd positive so it seems to be like a equalizer uh would whatever risk they have or you know whatever treatment they received irrespective of whether they received transplant or not so the, the numbers looks not very great the numbers are le less because the mrd assessment was not done in i think all patients so what is your thoughts sir like about mrd negativity uh when a standard risk you know delaying trans because we, we are not getting any pfs advantage here in the mrd negative group and how 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 easy or you know uh, i would say in practical in our setting to use this in decision making correct so i will going to answer this quickly i think this is uh, as of now uh, association we have to prove that this is actionable and also we have to prove that we are able to overcome the negative impact of a positive mrd so as of now we don't act on mrd but we know that this is a robust prognostic marker of outcome irrespective of the treatment so as of now i will leave it to that level only the importance so of mrd so my question is more towards mrd negative group that they are not getting immediate benefit with transplant so so in those group what is your thought about doing a transplant so, versus negativity yeah so you have to wait for that current ifm 2019 study where mrd negative low risk patient are being randomized to additional four cycle stop quadruplet followed by maintenance and other arm is getting uh, transplant and uh, i think maintenance so till that time we probably should not be but definitely it is logical that probably this is the subset where the value of transplant will go down uh, fast provided they are not uh, high risk thank you thank you so i'll bring in madam here madam what is your thought about current use of if you have an uh, if you can do mrd uh, now and then you want to use it about this data of mrd negativity and you know the pfs benefit is not there so is it the uh, time to use it for, for transplant decision i hope i am audible yes ma'am they're audible so so lingaraj i think it's only prognostication as of now i don't think there is any change in therapy or any decision on maintenance or any decision on you know uh, delaying any subsequent therapy i don't think that is the time is still there for that but yeah prognostication is yes and again this trial shows the same thing that if you achieve mrd negativity irrespective of what treatment you have received the pfs is going to be the same so i think as of now it's only prognostication yeah so my reserving transplant when you need at first relapse and get give that benefit of pfs instead instead of doing now in mrd negative vrd if you have uh, so i don't think we have evidence to say that you know uh, based on the clinical trial data but i'm i'm actually looking at the same trial and if you have everything in your favor you you are not worried about not able to do transplant at a later time point when they relapse even if you do not have access to so many novel agents the subsequent lines of therapy actually the trial suggests the same so you you can actually do not lose anything on the os uh, though here you have almost you know just only 28% of patients who underwent transplant as a second line therapy even then there was no difference in os probably as you know laboni mentioned that it could be novel therapies but having said that that's the the message goes the same that you can reserve your effective second line therapy for a later date without even losing any survival benefit thank you thank you i'll bring in nikita here nikita what what is your practice about mrd do you do mrd and and what if uh, and what is your thinking about mrd uh, i know about the data that there is hardly any data in terms of predictive value of mrd all of that we have available is the prognostic values and if you can see this this uh studies which are you know pub, uh, published lately and the mrd negativity is increasing uh, with each addition of new drug so so if you have a value do you use it in your center or or what is your thought about the future use of mrd 
I think as Madden said, MRD is only prognostic at this point. Uh, with regards to this study, MRD was done by sequencing. So I, I don't know of uh, uh, of uh, centers in India that uh, uh, that so, do. Uh, so the sensitivity was one in ten to power five only. So I think that sensitivity you can achieve with flow also. Uh, so but is it always the same? I would have thought. I, I'm not sure. I would so have thought. I think uh, yeah. and so, flow. So NGS and flow, uh, next gen flow. If they, if you do a one in one in ten to the power five, they, they, uh, the uh, the prognostic value is same. Unless you have one in ten to the power six by NGS, they do have better prognostic value as compared to flow. I think as of now, I mean here at least in uh, at our institute, we uh, we offer. Uh, uh, transplants through the the uh, state uh, insurance scheme as well but uh, honestly there are there is a, a significant number of patients that don't want a transplant so sometimes i find that uh, a doing an mrd prior to transplant is more satisfying the physicians if it is negative then you know that uh, or or even with this data you feel like okay the patient will probably uh, uh, will will do all right for uh, some time. It's okay to not offer transplant uh, to that category of patients. Having said that, um, we we are very careful of uh, 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 repeating MRDs because of, obviously there's a cost involved. Yeah. So across the board, we do it on day hundred post transplant. If a patient doesn't have transplant, then maybe after six or nine cycles. But the few patients who we have done an MRD um, uh, on post-induction chemotherapy, that's usually six cycles later, we don't find a very high MRD negativity uh, rate. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of uh, VTD, there's some cybody and VRD for uh, ISS3 or other high-risk uh, abnormalities. So yes, we will not, um, I mean, this is not going to be practice changing in the sense that if they are MRD negative, uh, we're not going to not offer a, a, a transplant as madam said it is it is only prognostic uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, treatment decisions are not uh, taken on the basis of okay. this so i'll give you a scenario suppose you have done a transplant and did an mrd and mrd is positive so what is your decision about using consolidation uh, vrds and making it negative versus just starting maintenance so again i think the data is strongest for consolidation uh, vrd after upfront cybody now, when you use VTD, uh, I really don't know what the data is on, uh, you know, if the patient is MRD positive on giving them further VTD or switching to VRD. But uh, yes, who's, if someone is MRD positive, we continue or we give consolidation PI imid uh, triplets for three or four cycles. Uh, the data on that, I'm really, uh, I really, I mean, please, please uh, enlighten us on uh, uh, um, Sir, what is your take, sir, about, uh, suppose you have a post-transplant MRD positive patient is in VGPR, so you'll give consolidation or you start uh, maintenance? I, I, I don't know. It is difficult. There is no data to say that consolidation works, but if you see that IFM study, there are two cycles of consolidation and maintenance, and if you compare across the trial, probably there was no benefit when you are using VRD. But if we have VTD or VCD, as Dr. Nikita said, it might be. There is some benefit probably in high-risk patient also doing tandem transplant, etc. So we will have to use a judgment. So Lingraj, I would like to come to Ms. We know that PFS is benefit. We are having PFS benefit and there is no overall survival benefit. The transplantation rate required for the requirement in IFM 2009 and trial. So this definitely points that the utility of transplant in at least first line is going down. But still, there are uh, situations where first-line transplant might be useful. So maybe we can have thoughts from Anand, Sumit, and uh, Sachin, if you are able to comment on this. What, what are the situations where you would think that a transplant, uh, let's see uh, our situation. Yeah, maybe Sachin sir is there. Sumit is there. Sumit, uh, Sachin sir, yeah. Anyone uh, while they gather their or no Lingraj, I will uh, I will tell so, you. So this twenty one percent PF. Yes. Yes, Anand, go ahead. So the question is, where do we uh, use uh, consolidation? For, I can uh, hear you, uh, Lingraj. Where are you telling anything? Yeah, uh, Bhavsef sir is asking about the uh, the issue of uh, you know the use of uh, transplant in our patients uh, looking at the PFS gain, sir. I still can't hear you clearly. What is the question? Hello? Yes, 
Hello. Uh, I still couldn't hear you. What was the question? Sir, you want to come in? Bhavashya, sir. Uh, yeah. So, you know, um, we spoke about uh, uh, the outcome of PFS uh, without uh, transplant in first line setting. But uh, is there any situation where first line transplant would be preferred? Uh, so, the, I'm sure there are situations. So, I wanted Sachin or Anand to comment on this. So, as of now, with whatever literature is available in first line setting itself, transfer line would be recommended for everyone. Is, is that what you are asking? Yeah, yeah, Sachin. And... Uh, uh, so, the fact, the the question with that whether MRD negativity would negate the benefit of transplant is at best brought out by several subgroup analysis, which are at best hypothesis generating. So it is essential to study that further or analyze that further in larger groups in order to definitively answer that question, that whether we can avoid a transplant in MRD negative subgroup, especially the standard cytogenetic risk. But as of now, None of the study has focused specifically on transplant versus no transplant in MRD negative post-induction situation. So all the two major studies, the determination study and the French trial, both of them randomized upfront or during the first cycle of chemotherapy. So the question whether in MRD negative situations post-induction we should avoid a transplant is something which is which is scientifically unanswered at present, although it does seem intuitive that in that subgroup, it may be feasible to keep transplant as a salvage therapy, post-relapse yeah, therapy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sajan. I think that was an uh, important point. But uh, just to bring out other points, sir, for example, feasibility of uh, this kind of approach in our setting, you may not have uh, feasibility yeah, so, to store uh, the stem cells. Yeah, so sir, my take on this yes, one is, one is that if, if a patient is elderly, that is approaching 60s, then probably we should trend, tend to an upfront transplant because when the patient may relapse few years down the line, the patient may not be fit for a transplant at that time of point of time and we would be losing out on an important uh, and a very important modality of treatment. Uh, second is if somebody has a high risk cytogenetics, then probably we should up, up, offer them transplant uh, upfront rather than so, later on because they tend to relapse faster early, have more aggressive relapses. So answer, although this this study does is this study has uh, put a doubt on whether we could should actually you know think of 17p as as kind of um, whether it 17p subset does have that much benefit from transplant, but this is just a subgroup analysis. So I still think that 17P should almost also be offered transplant. There's no level one evidence to suggest that 17P do not benefit that, that much from transplant. It's just a small subgroup analysis where the benefit may not be that much, but this is that is because of the nature of 17P per se that they don't do well with any form of therapy including uh, the other forms as well as with transplant. So uh, I still think that these patients should also get uh, a benefit of transplant, although that the, the benefit that they get from transplant may not be as much as the others. Yeah. The third, as Bhausab sir pointed out, is that your center should have resources to uh, harvest and cryopreserve stem cells. If you don't have it, then upfront transplant should be the, the way forward because if you don't you, you are not able to cryopreserve stem cells up front as the patients receive more and more treatment they we may, may not get adequate uh, stem cell dose later on yeah so another the contrary argument for that is that if you see the IFM no 75 percent patients underwent transplant in the control arm but if you see the determination only 24 percent patient underwent transplant in the control arm and still they get the same outcome so the concept of that if you do transplant if you delay there will be the ineligibility so anyway we are doing less transplants even at um, you know at the salvage setting for control arm and you're getting the same outcome agreed so this this study in this study most many of the patients in the relapse setting did not undergo transplant uh, so uh, uh, it uh, I would, uh, I mean, 
i agree that uh, no that does uh, uh, cast a doubt but then uh, the patients in transplant uh, arm did do well in terms of pfs so uh, i would not say that this this would uh, study would say that we should not do transplant transplant should still be the standard of care for our patients yeah, can i add yes. a couple of things there yes 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 sachin yes yeah, so when, so the, the thing is that with a follow up of uh, 76 months it may not be enough to pick up a os difference for a post relapse salvage transplant versus no transplant mm-hmm. if, if you the fact is true that in the determination study only about 20% or 25% underwent transplant in the salvage setting as against that close to 80% of the patients in the friend study did undergo a transplant at relapse but then if it is to pick up a yeah i think we lost him a much longer follow up will be required yes. so therefore i wouldn't say that uh, the fact that the lesser proportion of patients has undergone transplant and still the os is same we have not looked at a post relapse os that is that is uh, if we look at the post relapse os in the two studies in the vrd arm and compare those two outcomes then it will give you some meaningful information as to what transplant adds in that setting that's a post relapse os okay the friend study was x and in the determination study was y then those two figures are essential to understand what the role of what is the role of transplant in in post relapse setting in salvage setting in those who are not undergone an upfront transplant yes thank you thank you sir so uh, i will bring in nikita here so so i am looking at uh, the subsequent lines of therapy this patient received and i could see patients receiving carfilzomib daratumumab so is that the reason why we you know, we are not getting that benefit of os because we did get os benefit in the chemotherapy era but now you have effective therapies and how many of our patients are going to receive these kinds of therapy at relapse and is that making a difference uh, nikita what's your thought you make a very good point obviously you know one really questions themselves in a country like ours with limited access um is a discussion on a study like this moot because we really don't have too many of these subsequent lines thankful for uh, pomlidomide and the generics available aside from that there's so little uh, uh, available that uh, Uh, we really cannot rely on the efficacy of second line uh, uh, drugs and very slowly we see in we see clinical trials uh, trickling into uh, the country right i mean the uh, the last was selinexor and uh, there may have been other reasons why selinexor even approached uh, 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 our uh, country as well and uh, then i think uh, there are very few there is probably there's one more study uh, or uh, that they're trying to bring in uh, uh one of those newer uh, uh, drugs i forget the agent but the criteria is funny the patient should have received daratumumab previously and not uh, carfilzomib so how many patients would have received dara not carfilzomib i think there is a new amgen study that's uh, uh, that's coming into the amgen or i don't remember the company but the other point is over years everything has really uh, survivals have improved right and one is this um, uh, induction vrd in the swog study that compared vrd against lendex progressive disease on vrd was about 3 to 5% but here you can see on vrd the progressive disease percentage is only 0.3 so everything seems to have improved it's not uh, uh, it's not just the effect of transplant etc but induction chemotherapy outcomes are improving and everything but like you very nicely pointed out we do not have access to uh most of the newer agents and therefore we should be offering transplant to everyone including uh 17p uh, uh including patients with a 17p deletion thank you so uh, nikita here 80% patients in i think both the arm received any form of subsequent therapy what what is your uh, what is your experience in your center how many of the patients received uh or how many patients are not eligible to receive second line because of say whatever reason because of the you know Uh, comorbidities or you know poor performance status or in life threatening toxicity no i think second line uh, uh, most patients are able to receive second line treatment i i mean uh, they they are uh, they are fit to receive second line uh, treatment but once we've received we've given btd we've tried some lenalidomide that is uh, uh, giving lenalidomide in the second line 
and again we haven't published it we need to look at it carefully but we've seen lenalidomide doesn't really work very well well once a patient has failed uh, thalidomide in the previous line so then we of course we we jump to pomalidomide immediately and uh, we have a good number of patients who who continue pomalidomide for long periods of time i mean the pfs is anywhere between 6 and 9 months but we see some patients going on uh, uh, well beyond uh, one year a good number of uh, patients so i would say patients are eligible for uh, a second line but okay. how many have a meaningful pfs after that it yeah. is definitely less than maybe 40% thank you thank you geeta i'll bring madam here Ma madam if i remove direct move of carfil jume you know extra jume from this list uh, which most of our patients may not afford will will it, will it be okay to say that we could have get an ois benefit if this study was done in a you know elmic setting where the post protocol therapies are very few if you were not able to do transplant for majority in your uh, what do you call the rvd arm yes ma'am the control or so called the control arm in that case answer probably would be yes that you would have got a ois difference but if was if you were able to do the transplant in significant proportion of patients who have received only rvd and len maintenance i, I have my doubts that it will have uh, difference in terms of outcomes sir you want to comment any boss sir yeah i think these are all valid arguments whether we have access to this kind of drug and we are going to be delayed as far as uh, our access to this drug is concerned but another important point is cost lingraj the way daratumab is priced you know it is uh, transplant is cheaper than that so that also has to be factor in another important point is the activity of transplant still remains in the very strong regimen vrd backbone so the pfs improvement in this study was 21 month and coincidentally the initial atal et al 1996 study where it was chemotherapy based back on the pfs is also 21 month and this seems to me that probably because of the nature of the action this melphalanding alkylator and we are more uh, of a novel agent era people so this probably work together this can be still used uh, in this patient uh, population only question is uh, timing isn't it so definitely we will see how it evolves uh, in the future but it still seems to be active and it probably has more role in our setup nikita you want to make a point nothing else nothing okay. else okay okay so i'll bring in maybe uh, anand sir here so about the the so, so second transplant uh, 13 percent patients in the rvd arm so uh, my question to you is sir how uh, how many percent of patient you think we will be able to do that in our setting second transplant and is it a good option now uh, is the patient has don't have other options of novel therapy so uh, in our experience we have not been able to do many second transplant maybe less than 2% of our patients undergo second transplant uh, one is one is because of the cost which is the most important and second is the patient's fitness when the patient um, is uh, 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 relapses and third is uh, the the dfs so the second transplant is uh, an option when the patient has actually uh, relapsed for a long time of a transplant if the patient relapses early obviously the second transplant is not an option so um, in my our experience second transplant is uh, not offered to many patients in our country the most important being the cost of treatment and most patients are not able to undergo a second transplant in fact uh, even first transplant we are not able to get to most of our patients because of the accessibility and the cost so second transplant is our main goal should be try to try to get the first transplant for almost everybody that that should be our main goal yeah so this is the end of my slides so if, if anybody has any questions maybe uh, can raise and we can have a discussion i have one uh, question yes, Nikita, so yes. for multiple myeloma in a country like ours is pfs uh, more important than overall survival yeah and there's a million dollar, dollar question you're asked so i think uh, if you ask me my personal opinion is yes it make a difference because i think it is about the number of lines of therapy the patient is able to receive that will overall that will determine the overall outcome of that patient so if the patients uh, we can keep them 
well in the will disease control state and more lines of therapy they are able to receive so i believe that makes sense to improve their pfs and as i said that my only reservation is about this post protocol therapies and if you are not able to deliver that probably that's my thinking that if you do this study in in our setting probably you will still get an os maybe an os benefit i'm not sure thank you so nikita just i think uh, what you meant was whether pfs will translate into an os improvement uh, that was the question because uh, in our setting to the os does remain <laughs> important and we can say that there may not be you know several second line therapy options available so pfs will translate into an os benefit but i think the os still remains the gold standard thank you madam So, Bhavsa sir, you have any points to make? No, Lingraj. I think we are adequately discussed. I, I think this study has many uh, uh, important, uh, good things. This is being really discussed widely on uh, uh, social media, etc. Good thing was inclusion of African American, twenty percent of the patient, which is more common in that uh, ethnicity, and uh, in that subset uh, subgroup analysis, they didn't benefit much. Uh, so uh, definitely this study is important for uh, every student should go and read this study and if you have opportunity listen to the uh, ask oral presentation and the discussion after that it's still really informative thank you so thank you thank you all the um, faculties and also the residents uh, and thank you nikita and um, thank you madam thank you thank you sachin sir and thank you anand sir so we'll close here Thank you so much. Thank you.